My name is Joel Finkelstein. I am a, a junior researcher at CCARE and uh, one of the founding members of CCARE. And I, I would like to start by thanking uh, CCARE um, and Dr. Doty especially. We also want to thank the Telluride Institute and Pam and John Lift and Zoline uh, because I think they've done a great job putting a lot of this together. So my, my talk is called Optogenetic Tool Development and Application Dissecting Dopaminergic Circuitry and Social Behavior. And actually, I know that's a lot to swallow, but, but we're going we're gonna to dissect this because this is actually my, my outline. Okay? So there's three things that, that we're going to learn about today, and not necessarily in this order. The first is optogenetics. Um, the second is about this, this midbrain dopaminergic circuitry. And, and finally, we're going to learn a little bit about social behavior. Um, Let's start with some housekeeping about dopamine. So I'm going to talk to you about a few things today. One of them is the VTA, which is an ancient brain area that's involved in producing dopamine in our brains, and also the nucleus accumbens. Now, what's funny is tomorrow you're going to hear this a lot from folks who do affective neuroscience. We think the nucleus accumbens is involved in everything, right? So when you see a picture of someone that you're deeply in love with, you get a flash of activity in your nucleus accumbens. When, you, when someone gives you money, you get a flash of activity in your nucleus accumbens. When, when you are hot on the trail of something you're eagerly anticipating, you get activity in your nucleus accumbens. So we know that it's involved in reward, reward activity, and reward expectation. We know that it has roles to play in attention and approach behavior. Um, and it's a murky story what relationship this really has with, with social behavior and in the different categories of social behavior. One of the things Stephanie Brown said yesterday, which I thought was very telling, was that activity in this nucleus accumbens, in this area that, that, produ that uh, predicts hedonic reward, is actually associated with not being such a good mom, right? And so why is this? And what she said I thought was very telling is that, that even though, we, we, as we'll talk about in the, in the course of this talk, we see that uh, priming the nucleus accumbens um, actually causes approach behaviors um, that in some cases you actually need to shut those down in order to focus on people. And that when our environment is too enriched, when we are pursuing things that we find extremely exciting, this can actually lead to very bad social behaviors. Um, and so I think we have to understand, what I'm hoping you're taking from this is that social behavior is very complex, right? And oxytocin can lead to just really poor results with racism. Dopamine can lead to really poor results with neglect. And I hope that you take with you this, this idea that, that the, it's never so pretty or simple that a molecule will produce a pro-social effect. That is not what the, I think uh, the scientists in these panels are, 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 are discussing. So the second thing, we're, the, finally, we're going to talk a little bit about optogenetics and, and what this is. But first, I want to talk about why I think social behavior is interesting. So we know a little bit about pair bonding, not much. We know a little bit about nurturing and not much. But really, we don't even know that much about same-sex normal social behavior. As mammals, we do this. We have a kind of mammalian imperative to socialize. Our brains are the most active when we are interacting with one another because that is what our brains have been programmed to do, and that is largely what they are for, especially in, in later evolutionary stages. Um, so. The question about these circuits that are involved in these in, in uh, more straightforward same-sex social investigation, you know, th th there tends to be in psychiatric disease, for instance, um, impairment in normal social behavior and an ability to to understand people or to empathize with them. We see these in in uh, in depression, in autism, in schizophrenia, and so given that we know so little. I, I'm curious about what it is, what are the fundamental neurocircuits that, that underpin this phenomena? And then also, why is it that me and my friends who study neuroscience get, in, get into this social behavior? What is it that motivates us personally? Um, and how does that contribute to our neuroscience? So this is a loose schematic. Here we, we, can, we can take a look, about, um, look at, at this, this area, uh, the VTA in green in the hindbrain. And as you can see, the VTA actually projects to several downstream reasons. The, the, most, the most significant projection is to the nucleus accumbens. However, it also projects to the prefrontal cortex, where it's thought to play a role in attention gating, um, and, and also to the amygdala, to the hypothalamus, and to various other regions in the brain. 
Um, and so I'm going to focus today on this VTA. And it's the primary source of the neurotransmitter dopamine, and this is heavily involved in processing natural rewards, also broadly implicated in, in emotion and motivation. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about, I think it's helpful to, to understand this about the brain, that the brain is unrepentant in its complexity. Um, and and that, that to some extent, when people, when we talk about how the brain works, up until this generation, up until just recently, when, when we talk about how we can manipulate the brain or what we think about the brain, it's not with the capability of speaking the language of the brain itself. It's never been with an ability to cause things in a way that is ethologically valid as the brain itself produces them, right? So, for example, you know, there are these microcircuits when, when I say that, for instance, when I say the VTA is active, I can tell you the VTA is activating. You can see it in fMRI. It's like a Christmas light. It lights up. This is really deceptive. I mean, this is fundamentally deceptive. There are at least 20 different kinds of neurons in the VTA. Each of them have a very specific place in space and time. There is a frequency with which they fire there, or, or, or a, 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 a sort of gap in which they become silent. And this describes a very discrete language of space and time that gives rise to the complex phenomena of our phenomenological experience. There is a symphony of activity going on in your brain that is so unimaginably complex and puzzling that when we look at this in, in, in the fine microcircuitry, we realize that it's, it's just not enough to say it glows like a Christmas tree. So we can try to manipulate our brains in certain ways, but up until now, they've been very messy. One of the ways that we've tried to manipulate the brain and cause neural activity is through electrical stimulation. Now, with electrical stimulation, I'm going to tell you what science knows about electrical stimulation. I've just told you what science knows about electrical stimulation. <laughs> if somebody tells you they know how electrical stimulation works, whether it preferentially activates these axons or what types of neurons it preferentially activates, they, they are probably not representing an accurate picture of what we know about how electrical stimulation works. We know it, it probably acts in ways that are widely distributed throughout the region, do not have genetic specificity, and do not permit a kind of activation of subunits within microcircuits in a, in a kind of microdissection of, of, of the language of the brain itself. So when we're electrically stimulating, things are happening but we can't tell you what they are, and we know it's not relevant necessarily to how the brain itself is creating uh, it, its, its forms of communication. And so, recently, my, uh, my professor at Stanford uh, and, and mentor, Carl Dyseroth, created with uh, one of his students who's now at MIT a, a means of actually being able to dissect the language of the human brain and be able to understand and cause activity within the microcircuits that, under, that underpin more complex uh, uh, brain phenomena and behavior. And the way they did it is essentially in a way that is not dissimilar from the way that your eyes see light. Okay? When light hits your, hits your eye, it enters into a very special protein called an opsin. Um, and, and what happens then is that a change happens in the opsin, which produces a, a threshold activity that can, that can cause downstream activation or spiking within that neuron, and the signal is then given to your brain. Well, it turns out that, that neurons communicate with these, with these channels, with these ion channels, and that we, we have ion channels from algae that were found in ponds in, in threatened ecosystems, incidentally, right, that, that contain ion channels that we can activate with light. Well, so now let's say I take these, these ion channels, these, these same proteins that you have in your eyes, and now I'm going to inject them into your brain. And so what happens is, if I have the right targeting, I can take, oh, do I have a laser pointer? Yeah, okay, great. I can take light, and you can see these little ion channels here. And now when I turn on the light, when I activate this light, if I've infected a certain kind of neuron, which new techniques in genetic engineering allow us to target with high levels of specificity, I can now go within that microcircuit and activate the neuron I want, and the activity of that neuron 
will follow in high fidelity with this light pulse. Okay? This is called optogenetics. It allows us to play information into the microcircuits of the brain that, that essentially manipulate those circuits and then permit us to reverse engineer the circuits predicated upon the phenotypes that it produces. So, in other words, in layman's terms, we are injecting a virus into the brains of animals and controlling their minds with laser beams. We are doing a form of neural puppeteering. How many of you think that's a little creepy? Yeah, yeah, and I think it's a little creepy too. <laughs> but it's a very important fundamental research tool because what's going to end up happening is that we will use this to shed light on, on some of the most important questions in neuroscience regarding how, the, how brain circuitry is actually composed. So, this, and this is a, a slide that basically gives you a little bit of a schematic as to how we are targeting, some of the genetic tricks we have for targeting these dopaminergic neurons. So here you see we have what's called a TH Cree mouse. So when you hear Cree, think key, as in lock and key. Okay? This is a mouse that has been given, for all intents and purposes, a key protein that has been knocked into its genome, that, and the key unlocks a virus we're going to inject inside the mouse's brain. And what this allows us to do is that it allows us to get very specific targeting of only the dopamine circuits when we inject this virus because our virus has a lock and the dopamine mouse, this mouse, has been actually bred to have a key in only those neurons. So now when I put in my, my, my opsins and when I, when I aim my laser beams, I'm only going to be getting those neurons that are specifically involved in this microcircuitry. And here you have a schematic of that injection. Um, and also you can see here another schematic. This is um, a 30 hertz uh, pulse that's given to uh, a neuron that, that's being recorded from. And you, as you can see, only Cree expressing neurons will be sensitive to the blue light that we're shining into the, into the animal's brain. And this is a sort of image of what this looks like. So, and what's cool about this, what's neat about this, is that optogenetics gives us the ability to figure out what the causal role of a specific cell type is in a behavior. And so now, instead of looking at the correlate, we can test hypotheses directly by simply going in and activating the neurons we think are, are involved in one process or another, and then seeing if the evidence supports our ideas. Here's a schematic of, of what we've, we've done to some of these, uh, uh, where, where we're targeting the light in some of these animals. And there you see the light is actually hitting the VTA. It, it has a, what's called a fluorophore on it, which allows us to see it and image it under a microscope. And you can see that though we've injected the virus everywhere, the only place that it's expressing is in this VTA. Um, and there, on, on the second slide, you can see it, it's co-expressing with only these dopaminergic neurons. Um, and, and this is just evidence that we are, in fact, causing spiking by shining these little blue light pulses that you can see along here. So now here's our behavioral paradigm. We take, we take an animal and put them in a cage with another mouse um, and shine blue light um, in one case and then refrain from shining light in another. Um, and so we take a few minutes to sort of charge up the dopamine here. And then all of a sudden, we put in another mouse into the cage. And as the light is on and activating the neurons inside the mouse's brain, we can see what effect this has on its interaction with the juvenile. Now, unfortunately, though we tried very hard, I don't think I'm going to be able to play these movies. Nope, I can't play these movies. Um, so I'm going to have to give you a descriptive picture of this. And I will have this on a PC if anybody wants to see images of this afterwards. I'll play it on a small screen for you. It's quite, it's quite interesting. In the first video, what happens is we put the, the juvenile in, and there's some interest. I mean, animals will have a natural sort of propensity for investigating one another. Uh, the, the animal here has a, 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 a sort of cemented fiber optic there, and, and then when we put the other animal in, no light happens, and, and there's some investigation. In the second, you see the same animal and what happens is now we turn the light on and it begins like haunting this other animal and doing the, it's sniffing, doing tail sniffing and coat sniffing and licking and grooming. And it spends, it spends uh, about quite a, quite a while longer actually investigating um, this conspecific. And here you see some of our data. As you can see here, here's the difference with light off with this animal. And then here's what happens when we turn the light on. Um, and we get a pretty a significant increase in investigation. 
And then this is uh, just a, a schematic of the, the controls. The controls we just, we don't put, we put a virus in that has no ops in. And we can see that there's a, a very clear difference in the amount of investigation time. And this is only a couple of minutes long, um, the, the amount of time that we're allowing them to interact. Um, and so the question is, is this specific to social behavior? Now there's no reason to think it should be because dopamine, as I mentioned before, has been implicated in all kinds of approach behaviors. Um, and so um, we, we tried to put this in, we, we put the animals through what's called an open field test to see if this was doing something to the locomotor activity, and we saw nothing. And then finally, we, put, we, in, we introduced a novel object. In other words, okay, we're causing this dopamine release, but is this just causing them to become obsessed with new things? Are they simply getting obsessed with it? And what we found is that we did not see a, a large increase in investigation of novel objects. Okay, so I'm almost done. Um, so what that tells us is that there may be something, there's two possibilities. One, as you can see, they didn't investigate these novel objects very much, which is not unusual, actually. We, we needed to control for the social condition by allowing them the same amount of time to, see, to investigate a novel object to see if it was just novelty that was being increased. Um, but they didn't really investigate the objects nearly as much as they investigated each other. Um, and and uh, so it may be that the objects simply aren't novel enough to uh, see the effects of a dopaminergic uh, intervention here. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll have to do some more, some more work with that. So I want to make an acknowledgement now for uh, the folks in my lab who I'm very grateful for. Um, and uh, also I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Doty, who actually I have to say at the origin of, of C-Care had suggested this as, as an idea um, and thought that this would be something that would be uh, worth doing and, and quite interesting. And actually it's received uh, quite a lot of attention and uh, I think has been quite novel. I'd also like to thank my, my uh, co-first author, Lisa Gnaiden. Um, and she, is, she has been a mentor uh, and someone who's really taken a lot of initiative in leading this work. Um, and, and I would also encourage you, I have a poster of the full details of this work because in addition to just stimulating the VTA circuitry, we've also looked at what happens in downstream regions because we can isolate very specific projections from the VTA. As I told you at the beginning, there's many of them. And this technology allows us to actually look at each of these individual projections to understand their role in social behavior. And it's quite varied, and it paints an interesting picture. So I'm keeping my poster up in the back. If anybody wants to either see the social interaction or get more information about the poster, I'll be available for a few minutes if you wanted to, to, to talk a little bit about that. And finally, I'd like to thank Carl Dyseroth, um, who is uh, my PI and, and uh, uh, Quite, quite an extraordinary thinker in his own right. And thank you very much.